This is part two of the series exploring the Ubuntu Touch platform, which is a Linux platform for phones. If you haven't seen the first part, make sure to watch that first so you get all the basics. In this video, I'll explain how Ubuntu Touch is installed and run on an Android phone, and then we'll compare it to how this works on a Pine phone, which is a true Linux phone. Next. Before the availability of the Pine phone, Ubuntu Touch only ran on Android devices. There were no existing pure Linux hardware devices. Now, there are two ways to run Ubuntu Touch, and this will likely continue on to the future. One is to continue to use existing Android phones, and with very little alteration, there will also be the implementation of UB ports on the pure Linux device. First, let's talk about Android phones so you can understand how Ubuntu Touch works with it. Let me give you an analogy to help you understand how Ubuntu Touch relates to the Android device. Think of the Android device as a building. The Android building is owned by Mr. Android. Mr. Ubuntu Touch is a tenant. Now, he's a major tenant for sure, but he doesn't own the building. And Mr. Android gets to choose where its tenants can rent space. The first floor, boot, is always Android. This is reserved for Mr. Kernel, who is an associate of the Android building management. The thing about Mr. Kernel is that he's kind of an old, ornery kind of guy, set in his ways, and not keen to do new things with new people like Mr. Ubuntu. So he can sometimes be a pain to work with. But he really worked well with the older tenants, even the secretive kind of tenants. He's more of a pain with the newer tenants. There are other tenants in the building associated with Mr. Androids, and you can't kick out those tenants. You can only reach the other floors of the building by going through the first floor elevators controlled by Mr. Colonel. But Mr. Android at least gives Mr. Ubuntu Touch the bulk of the space. However, the security guards, the management team, the operation of the air conditioning, heating, power, telephone are all controlled by management, Mr. Android and company. That infrastructure is kept separate in other floors and Mr. Ubuntu Touch is asked not to mess with it. Those other Android floors are locked. Now sometimes the building wiring is screwed up and electric power is off or there are some wiring issues with internet access or the air conditioning vents aren't properly placed. Those are normal things in the life of Mr. Ubuntu Touch that he has to deal with since Mr. Android doesn't give any kind of help in any way. So Mr. Android tells Mr. Ubuntu to figure it out himself or he'll raise the rent. That in a nutshell is how Ubuntu Touch works on Android. Now let's compare this to a Pine phone. In this case, Mr. Ubuntu Touch owns the Pine phone building. He doesn't do all the work himself, but he has contractors. He sets up his own Mr. Colonel in the first floor, but it's up to him. Mr. Colonel is just a hired contractor and will do the job that Mr. Ubuntu wants, or Mr. Colonel gets replaced. Mr. Colonel is a fresh grad from the grad school of the university, latest batch of grads. Mr. Ubuntu likes to hire the newest grads all the time. Mr. Colonel can be fired and replaced at any time if Mr. Ubuntu is unhappy. Now, Mr. Ubuntu Touch also hired the doorman who is Mr. U-Boot. He opens the door for everyone. There was no doorman in the Android building. This door self-opened, so we don't really know how it works. Mr. Ubuntu gets to decide which floors he wants to use for what, and no one can challenge him. His only limitation is the size of the building. Fortunately, when Mr. Ubuntu bought the building, all the electrical wiring, the air conditioning, the heating, the internet access are all running and under control. However, he may have to hire a contractor like an electrician to tweak the devices that don't work. It doesn't always work, but at least he can hire the people that can figure it out. It just takes time. Now, the Android management is good and all, but they're kind of secretive, so they're harder to work with especially with that old guy, Mr. Colonel, and those Mr. Blobs that he hangs out with. They're all kind of secretive. Okay, end of analogy. Let's use real world terms now. So when Google releases a new Android version, let's say when it releases an Android 11, 
Google picks a Linux kernel that they'll use. They'll modify that heavily. Then it is packaged with the latest in Google related code from bootloading to running the Android OS. The kernel used by Google is always based on some original Linux kernel. It is always older than the mainline Linux version. For older Androids, this can be kernel 3.1 to 3.4 on my Nexus 5. And newer Androids may use, for example, Linux 4. But this kernel is heavily modified by Google, so it really does more than what the kernel originally had. It is not in sync with mainline Linux at all, and has not been for a long time. The current or mainline Linux kernel is 5.4. This first Google release is for the Android Open Source Project, or AOSP, for this particular version. And it does not include Google Apps and Google Play related stuff. It's just the main phone functionality. Google Apps is not open source. So, for each new Android version, Google sends each new version of AOSP, a plain vanilla, and it is sent to each OEM, which are the manufacturers like Samsung, LG, Huawei, and so on. Each OEM then starts with what is provided by Google. And Google specifies what devices they can have if they're going to be remaining compatible with Android. And then from there, Google allows manufacturers to add features that are not standard with AOSP. The OEMs also provide the drivers that are proprietary and not shared by Google as open source. For example, those blobs. So each OEM packages their stuff with the AOSP and modifies the AOSP and gets it running. Then they add the Google app stuff on top of that, and now you have a finished Android phone. Typically, the drivers that are not part of AOSP include the camera drivers, sensors, the baseband modem, video streaming codecs, things like that. Now, make a note of this because these typically are where the issues occur when porting to a new Android device. Okay, now, how does Ubuntu Touch Postmarket OS, Sailfish OS, and even Lineage OS fit into this. Well, these Linux OS makers or Android custom ROM providers have to work with the original Android code. Lineage OS is the closest. They take the code that is basically AOSP and add the modifications made by the OEM. Then they add little tweaks to the UI, but in general, it's still the base AOSP. The Linux OS providers have a much bigger job though because they have to replace a big chunk, but not all, a big chunk of AOSP with their version of Linux and their own Linux functionality. Let's look at this chart that shows the interaction between the kernel, Ubuntu Touch, and Android. As you can see from the chart, the kernel is separate. Like I said, that's provided by Google. Then in order for Ubuntu Touch to interact with the drivers, Ubuntu has to keep some version of Android running in the background, and that interacts with the original device drivers that Ubuntu Touch has no drivers for. So in this chart, everything in orange operates inside Ubuntu Touch. Everything in blue operates in this Android instance that's running side by side. And then there's a layer that allows the Ubuntu and Android to talk to each other, and that layer is called LibHybris, which is in purple. Let's dig much deeper here. Let's look at the flash storage of an Android phone. The storage is pre-partitioned into these sections. There's boot, recovery, system, data, cache, miscellaneous. There could be others like SD card slots and so on. In my building analogy earlier, you can think of these as being separate floors. These partitions are fixed on an Android phone. In fact, they're pretty much sized as created by the OEM. So you're kind of stuck with whatever space is provided on each partition, which is likely decided by the OEM based on what space is on the flash storage. The boot partition contains the actual Linux kernel. The Linux kernel in the boot partition is the first thing started when you start the phone. In order to run, the Linux kernel always needs some disk space and it temporarily mounts one in memory and this is called init RAM FS. 
With this temporary storage, it is able to do things to check on the hardware and then it mounts the other systems on the flash storage. It mounts on different partitions. After it's able to see the partitions, it can then now go into the system partition and start the process for the Android operating system, which is on there. This is a read-only memory or ROM area and it's made to contain all the standard programs that come with a basic Android like the Java interpreter and some basic apps and so on. This system part is what is first replaced by an alternate system image which in the case of UB ports is Ubuntu 16.04. So in order to change the phone from running Android to Ubuntu, the Ubuntu OS is loaded into that system partition. The data area is where all the unique settings are for a specific installation. On a brand new Android phone, the data area will be wiped out and the OS will likely put default settings on it when it starts. This data area is also used by Ubuntu Touch as the writable part of the phone, but the system area stays put. That doesn't change. Let's talk about an installation of Ubuntu Touch on a phone so you get the basic picture of the boot sequence. When you want to load Ubuntu Touch, you will typically have to go into recovery mode. For example, on a Nexus 5, this would be holding down the volume button and the power button. That action triggers the phone to run the program that is in the recovery partition. Google supplies a basic recovery program which is part of a stock Android. Many Android users also modify their recovery by installing a recovery called twerp, TWRP. This is often used for loading Android custom ROMs and it is also compatible with a regular Android. In general, when you install Ubuntu Touch using the UB ports installer, that installer will install the Ubuntu recovery which will replace the one from Android or the one from Twerp. This recovery program goes into the recovery partition. After installing it, you'll be asked to restart the recovery again. So the UB ports recovery will now be the one running. As part of the UB ports installer process, the UB ports installer will place a copy of Ubuntu.img image, which is Ubuntu Touch, in a system.image, which is Ubuntu 16.04, in the root of the data partition. When you boot the phone, the recovery will have been flagged that some newer system file is available. The system.image will be taken from data partition and then it will be installed into the system partition, replacing whatever was installed there before, like the original Android OS. So the program responsible for writing into the system partition is the recovery program. And that's what the recovery program does, whether it be a stock Android version of the recovery or twerp or the UB ports recovery. After everything is installed on system, then the phone can now be rebooted normally. The kernel in boot is started first. The Linux kernel does its thing and it slices the hardware, then passes the baton to the program loaded in system. If it's a Linux program like Ubuntu 16.04 in the case of UB ports, it will go there and start the program as bin in it. This is the normal point for starting Linux OS. Now, the job of the system image or Ubuntu 16.04 is to mount a temporary disk and RAM again, do initialization, initialize communications with the kernel devices, and then it will look for Ubuntu.image in the data partition. This will be the image of Ubuntu Touch itself. And as you can see, it's actually in a writable section of the Android device. Then the Ubuntu image is mounted as root using Cheroot. So now the new root is Ubuntu Touch. Whatever is in this Cheroot now replaces the functionality in Ubuntu 16.04. So you can see the separation here between Ubuntu 16.04 and Ubuntu Touch and gives us a little bit of understanding about how Ubuntu Touch can later be updated to use Ubuntu 20. If Ubuntu Touch just starts here and continues, it will not have access to devices that are not included in the AOSP kernel. So typically devices with proprietary drivers will not be accessible. The way Ubuntu Touch communicates with the original Android device drivers is by running a small instance of Android in another container. In the original Ubuntu Touch, that little Android instance was made by Canonical. 
This has now been standardized in a new way called Hallium. This Hallium project, which is really a consortium of many Linux projects, is the group handling the Android instance which runs inside Linux. When Ubuntu Touch is launched as the new root, it also creates a virtualized container using LXC, which isolates this Android process. This container is the one containing a simplified Android OS. Because the Hallium project is a shared project between many Linux phone distros, there are many contributors to it and makes the job of porting Android phones to Linux a bit easier. In order to have a consistent porting method, this Android instance is built first from a device-specific Android open source project. So for example, if the device is a Samsung X, Samsung will take the Android AOSP version they want to use, then they'll add their own device driver code to it. There's an organization that keeps track of all these AOSP versions after the OEM drivers are added. This is Lineage OS. They basically copy the drivers and files added by each manufacturer and then add a little bit of tweaks to make it unique. This is then available as a Lineage OS build. So Lineage OS is the base of the Hallium project for building this mini Android instance. So I imagine that the Hallium build process takes a standard Lineage OS for a particular device, strips out all the unnecessary code from Android, leaving only the drivers, and then adding some Hallium services that can communicate with the drivers, which is called Hybris. Then an inter-process communications layer is added, which is called LibHybris. The inter-process communications layer uses domain sockets, which are built into Linux interfaces to talk using something standard on Linux called sockets. The device drivers that originally got installed on a phone are only talking to the Hallium Android, so they have no awareness of the existence of Ubuntu Touch. Now, because this Hallium layer is now standardized, the Hallium project has been reused by Ubuntu Touch, Postmarket OS, Loon OS, Sailfish OS. It can work on any Linux version that is loaded on an Android phone. So, this is a general picture of the Android device again. Boot is left alone. Again, that has the kernel, so no one touches that. Data is the user data area which can be wiped empty and will indicate a factory reset. This is the writable section of Android or Ubuntu Touch. This is also where the Ubuntu.image is stored and loaded from. When you get an OTA or over-the-air update from UB ports, they'll store the update here in the form of a system.image file and an ubuntu.image file. Cache in Android is a special area which is used to put temporary files. Mostly it is used in Android to pre-compile the Android programs so they run faster and that's kept here. I've observed that Ubuntu Touch uses this, for example, for APT. So maybe installed dependencies are placed here. I'm not 100% sure of that. It's just what I noticed so far. For example, if I have too many dependencies to download, I get an error that there is insufficient space in cache. I believe the miscellaneous partition is space for the OEM to add the Android drivers and other firmware. This, I think, is where the vendor would load all their device driver blobs. These are files specific to a particular phone, so I imagine no one would mess with this after the OEM does its thing. Anyway, once you understand this, you can see now why it is so difficult to port devices from Android to Ubuntu Touch. And you can tell based on what's in the Hallium Android that that's where a lot of incompatibilities with the drivers are often found. Now, this is quite different on a Pine phone or even a Librem 5. These are true Linux devices from the ground up. There is no Android in there. So the Linux kernel is from mainline Linux. For example, if you go to this site on GitLab, in this Pine64 site, you will see the kernel which is based on Linux 5.4. This is based on mainline Linux. So if you install a typical Debian distro or Arch distro, or Alpine distro, it can use the same kernel as long as it is compatible with the architecture. In this case, ARM64 is used for phones. So let's compare how your Pine phone will operate differently from an Android. First, the bootloader is a common open source bootloader for ARM devices called U-Boot. 
Again, in the case of the Pine phone, the Pine 64 community maintains the U-boot version together with the kernel. So the U-boot and kernel then is consistent regardless of the Linux variant that will run it. Of course, you can change your own U-boot, but it will be the same normally with Ubuntu Touch, Postmarket OS, Sailfish OS, Loon OS, and so forth. Once the kernel boots, it goes through the normal Linux kernel boot process, offloading a temporary RAM disk, initializing the devices, mounting the drives, and then it passes control of the first process to Ubuntu 16.04 to that OS's sbin init. Then Ubuntu 16.04 mounts the Ubuntu.image as root into root as before, and then after mounting it starts sbin init, off Ubuntu Touch, and then Ubuntu Touch takes over. Now, how simple is that? There's no additional need for Halium because all the drivers for devices are either already provided by the kernel or may be added by the Linux distro itself during the init process. There are several more videos coming. Analyzing Ubuntu Touch is not simple, but personally as a developer, the basic understanding helps me get a gist of how porting can occur using Halium, how it will work with the Pine phone, and what some of the other limitations are. In the next video, I'll talk about the difficulties in Ubuntu Touch and how that is planned to be resolved soon. It's going to be an interesting video. Fortunately, as you will see, regardless of where you see Ubuntu Touch today, the good people at UB Ports have a very good roadmap and the end result will be a platform that's more flexible and much more consistent with regular Linux distros like Postmarket OS. Hopefully you liked the video and maybe you'll hit that thumbs up on it. Please subscribe to this channel to learn more. There are more videos related to UB ports and I'll also be studying the other Linux phone distros when I get access to them. Thanks for watching.